All right, let's go ahead and get started, everybody. Uh, welcome back to the Dharma Doors. I'm MC Owens, and this is the San Francisco Dharma Collective. Tonight, we're going to look at another sutta. Uh, we're still making our way through the Majjhima Nikaya. Tonight, we're moving on to sutta number 63. So this is our third sutta in the selection of suttas uh, given to bhikshus, given to monks. This one's called the Chula Malunkya Sutta, the smaller teaching given to Malunkya. Actually, his name's Malunkya Putta. But, uh, yeah, the shorter discourse, discourse to Malunkya Putta. Um, there is a longer, a Maha Malunkya Sutta, which we'll do next week. It's actually on a whole other topic. But tonight, we're going to look at this one. Um, I hope everybody's ready for some metaphysical speculation. <laughs> because tonight is all about metaphysical speculation. Um, so just to let you know, um, tonight the sutta is about, uh, it's kind of a famous topic, I would say, and it's the famous topic are the, the 10 questions the Buddha wouldn't answer. These are called the achintya, the, uh, imponderables or kind of inconceivables, but Hinayana inconceivable in that way. So this is a famous topic. It's it's this famous list of questions. There is a list where it's 14 questions, but in our sutta tonight, it's the traditional list of 10 questions that the Buddha supposedly wouldn't answer, just you know, wouldn't give an answer to one way or the other in that way. So this sutta tonight is about that, or those 10 questions. So we're gonna dive into those. And though this sutta is also sort of the, the source or the origin for a very famous Buddhist uh, analogy or simile. Uh, so we're going to read about that. That'll be uh, uh, about midway through the sutta. So um, let's go ahead and dive right in. The 10 unanswered questions, they come up right away. So let me read the beginning of the sutta. It'll introduce these 10 questions, but then I want to talk about, you know, what are, what are these questions? What, what, what exactly is going on? And then we'll continue with the sutta. Uh, so again, this is the little Chalu, Chula Malunkya Sutta, number 63. Thus have I heard. On one occasion, the Blessed One was living at Savati in Jetta's Grove, Anattapindika's Park a usual place for a sutta to take place. Then, while the venerable Malunkya Putta was alone in meditation, the following thought arose in his mind. These speculative views have been left undeclared by the Blessed One, by the Buddha, set aside and rejected by him. Namely, the world is eternal, and the world is not eternal. The world is finite, and the world is infinite. The soul, or the jiva, the life force, is the same as the body, and the jiva, or life force, or soul, is one thing, and the body is another thing. And another question. After death, a Tathagata exists, and or after death, a Tathagata does not exist, and or after death, a Tathagata both exists and does not exist, and after death, a Tathagata neither exists nor does not exist. The Blessed One does not declare these things to me. And I do not approve of and accept the fact that he does not declare these things to me. So I shall go to the Blessed One, and I'll ask him the meaning of this. If he declares to me either that the world is eternal, or the world is not eternal, or the world is finite, or the world is infinite, or the Tathagata exists after death, 
or the Tathagata does not exist after death, or the Tathagata both exists and does not exist after death, or after death the Tathagata neither exists nor does not exist. If he says any of those things, then I will lead the holy life under him. If he does not declare these things to me, then I will abandon the training and return to the low life. <laughs> All right, so let's let's get let's get Malunkya Putta's thinking uh, understood. Like, why is he so upset about this? Like, what's at stake here? So the those are the famous ten questions, or the, the famous ten answers in that way. Um, really quickly, just starting from the top, uh, Malunkya, Malunkya Putta. So whenever you see Putta. In Sanskrit, it would be putra or putta, putra. That means child. And it usually implies child of. So in this case, Malunkya is actually this monk's mother's name. And so Malunkya's child, the child of Malunkya, that's who this monk is. Same thing with Sariputra. So, uh, Shariputra was the child of Shari. That was his mother's name. Um, so you see this a lot in Buddhist Dharma names. The Buddha apparently called a lot of people, hey, ch child of so-and-so. So that's Malunkya. He appears in this sutta. He appears in the next sutta. And he has a poem. Uh, he became an arhat. He has his own little kind of story, but he's a kind of minor figure in the world of Buddhism. But then he's sitting around one day and he has this thought. The Buddha never answers these 10 questions. I'm going to go ask him. And if he answers them, I'll stick around and study under him. But if he refuses to answer, I'm out of here. That's what he says. Now, the questions are about, well, the first few, the first four questions are about the world. And even before we kind of get into this idea of the world being eternal or not eternal or finite or infinite, I kind of want to make clear that we could probably read this a few different ways. And what I mean by that is, is that you could read it as being about what we would call the universe, right? So not exactly just planet Earth, but the whole kit and caboodle, the whole uh, universe or whatever. That is one very strong un, you know, definition or way to translate the idea of the world, the, the loka which this idea of the, uh, um, is the sasata loko tipi, is the loko, is the world, eternal or not eternal. So we could be talking about the whole universe. I suppose we could be talking about just the planet, but I don't think there's any real reason to kind of stop at just the planet. You might as well just, go for the whole universe at this point. The reason why I'm kind of being so um, indecisive about this is that this is a completely different, you know, culture. So if I say universe, I'm already participating in a kind of very Western 20th century idea of, in other words, I'm already in a worldview. And this sutra is actually about worldviews. And so it gets tricky because you, we realize right away, oh, if we choose to translate loka or loko as universe, we are sort of confessing a particular worldview already. So it's just tricky. So I want to give you the, the whole like variety. So the Buddha here or the, the culture that has asked the Buddha this question is the world finite or is the world infinite? 
on the one hand, the question could be about the universe. The question could be about the planet or the world in that sense. The question could also sort of be about like you, 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 <laughs> you. And what, what I, when I say like you, I, of course, I don't mean, you know, that body, but it's the potential that whoever that, hi, it's a potential that you, that you keep going forever. And, and what I'm getting at is like an idea of like reincarnation that, yeah, you'll, you'll move along to another body and then another body and another body, and it'll just go on eternally. So what I mean by that is your world <laughs> is eternal or not. And notice that the idea of like your your subjective experience of being, right, of existing in a world, notice that that, the subject, your subjective experience of being in the world, that's different than the idea of the universe, like the objective physical universe. And the question about whether the objective physical universe goes on eternally or not. So when the Buddha has been asked, does is the world finite or infinite? The question that was being asked of the Buddha is either, <laughs> is the universe infinite or not? Or like, will I go on forever and ever and ever or not? Everybody kind of vibe on that basic idea? Well, now, because I want us to have like, I want us to like, really dig, dig into this sutta tonight. Like, I don't want to just kind of read it and it's like, oh, yay, and everybody was happy. <laughs> like, I want to dig into this. In particular, I want to dig into like our own worldview here for a moment. And so what I mean is, is that in the modern world right now today, in like modern, I guess you would call it astronomy, astrophysics, in the world of modern science, there's a debate. Is the universe, is the universe eternal? Or is it not eternal? It is a question. And this is what the kind of conversation about the Big Bang is about. But even the idea of the Big Bang, there's always this looming question of like, well, what was going on right before the Big Bang? And so the idea would be, well, if you think nothing was going on before the Big Bang, and if you think that eventually all matter will return in a way or something and then be done, well, then you might think that the universe is not eternal. But you might be in a kind of um, a person that thinks the universe just goes on forever and ever and ever and has been going on forever and ever and ever. Then you would, then that would mean that you think the universe, that sense of the world is eternal. Or we get away from kind of the idea of astronomy and physics and we move over to the world of religion and maybe you're a Christian and maybe you think that after you pass away, you might go to live in heaven with God forever. That would then be the worldview that, that something in the universe in that way is eternal and that your sort of the of subjective experience of being will go on in heaven forever. Or you're a nihilist and you think that, no, 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 once, I, once this dies, that's it. The subjective show is over. And then that would mean that you think the world is not eternal. 
everybody feeling me on this kind of definition of like what the Buddha is being asked about is the world eternal or is it not eternal? Now, the Buddha, of course, famously didn't answer, wouldn't say if the world was eternal or not. Now, the sutta that we're reading, we're going to find out why. We're going to find out why the Buddha didn't answer these. So I don't want to get ahead of the sutta in that way, but I want to just make sure that first that we understand the sutta, but I also want us to understand the sutta in our own modern terms. Like, I really want us to understand what's at stake so that when we get to the Buddha's answer, we'll maybe, you know, appreciate it more in that sense. So, everybody get about eternal or not? Well, let's talk about finite or infinite. Oh, yeah, Chris, please. Oh, no, sorry. Sorry, Chris, we've had a lot of problems. We're going to have to do a background check. We're going to have to have a whole, like, the FBI is going to come in before we can get your question. Sorry. <laughs> Okay, so Chris, right, so you can type your question in the chat if you want. Oh yeah, yeah. So we're doing that just to make sure we, again, Chris, we've had problems. So, um, okay. So unless we will go back to eternal, not eternal, let's move on to then the idea of infinite or finite. Yet another question that the modern physics world is wrestling with in terms of the universe. In other words, are there edges to the universe? Is there an edge to the universe? Does it have a finite ending? Or does the world, the universe, keep going forever and ever and ever and ever? It's an interesting question, right? Is the universe infinite or finite? It's Again, it's a very interesting question, and there's a lot of modern debate about that very question. And so the reason why I keep putting that, the reason why I keep putting it that way that there's like a still a modern debate going on 2500 years ago 500 years ago or 500 BC people were wondering is the universe infinite or finite is it eternal or not eternal hey the buddha's enlightened let's ask him and he refused to answer these things and here we are 2500 years later still wondering and I mean that the that the like the the finest intellectual scientific minds in the world are still debating about whether the world or universe is finite or infinite or eternal or not eternal. The the jury is still out on that one, or at least the last time I checked. Okay. Let's move on to question number, I guess this would be five and six. So the two, these two questions are about what, see here they translated as, and it's often translated as the soul. Is the soul the same thing as the body? Now, I know everybody, especially everybody here I know, has been studying Dharma for a long time. So you're not going to let that fly. I know you're not going to let that word soul just sneak in there. You're going to want to know no, 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 no. What exactly are they talking about? Are they talking about the Atman? Are they talking about the Pudgala? Like, what exactly are they referencing? Well, the, the actual wording of the Pali is about, is the Jiva the same as the Sarira or Sarira? That word Sarira, which means body, it's where you might, you might know the word Sharira, which is like a relic, a bone relic. Well, it's related to that larger word, sharira, the body. So the jiva, you know, jiva is like, again, we don't have the exact word for this in English, but jiva is about like life, life force. And, 
the, the really simple way of thinking about it is, is that you have a living being and you have a cadaver. <laughs> you have two bodies, but only one jiva, right? So, meaning one is alive, one body is not alive. So we are talking about life force, like animation, being alive. And the Buddha was asked, is jiva, is that life force the same as the body? Or is it like distinct from the body? Like it's one thing and the body is another thing. Now, of course, this is a question that's still being asked today in terms of what exactly is life. We, by the way, another question that has yet to be defined. There are, you know, Supreme Court cases up the wazoo trying to establish what life is, in particular because of these cases of euthanasia. And the question of what exactly is a cadaver, and in other words, it can be disposed of, and what is a life and therefore has rights? <laughs> These are huge questions. And in the modern world, we still, you know, we used to hold up a mirror. And if it fogged up, you had a jiva. Now, then it turned into a uh, heart, right? Then, no, 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 no. Then it turned into brain activity. Brain activity, I think, is where we're at now. Again, in terms of like Supreme Court cases and things like that. My point, of course, is not to settle this question, of course, that would be crazy, meaning in relation to the sutra. But again, what I want us to recognize is that these questions are still being asked today. That we still, as scientifically advanced as we are, we still do not exactly know, is life and the body in junto? Like, in the same, or are, is it two different things? Well, so that would be the idea of, is the jiva or the soul, life force energy, the same as the body, or is the one one thing, one another thing? All right. Now, the last four are about the tathagata, and they are, they are about a Tathagata, not the Buddha exactly, who is a Tathagata, a thus come one, an, an enlightened being in that sense. But no, the question was actually about Tathagatas. Like if somebody reaches the point of full-on Buddha awakening and they're a Tathagata, do they still exist after they die? Do they cease to exist after they die? Do they both <laughs> exist and not exist after they die? Or do they neither exist nor not exist after they die? So the Buddha was asked all four of those. So, hey, Buddha, does a Tathagata exist after death? Does a Tathagata not exist after death? <laughs> Does a Tathagata both exist and not exist? Does a Tathagata neither exist or not exist? So, the one thing that I want to make clear before we kind of move on to the rest of the sutta is I want us to kind of, I hope we all see that these 10 questions are all related. These 10 questions are not like, oh, I have a few questions about the world and I got a few questions about, you know, life force energy and I got a few questions about an enlightened being. No, no, these are all related. And it's why when we did the first four questions about the world, I wanted to present you with the possibility that they were talking about your subjective world, meaning like you as a being going on forever or not. Because you'll see that those questions are about that. Is the jiva the same as the body? So meaning when you die, does the jiva pop out? Does the life force pop out and like 
is something else? What if I made it to the point of enlightenment, Buddha? Would I continue to have an, a subjective experience after death? Meaning, if I was a Tathagata, would I exist after death? Would I not exist? Would I both exist and not exist? Would I neither? So you see how all the questions are, yes, they're metaphysical speculations, but they're metaphysical speculations about, mm, kind of about birth, death, and then what? It's like death and then what? <laughs> Is there eternality or not? Infinitude or not? Right? Is there a jiva separate than the body or not? Does an enlightened being exist after they die or not? Do all 10 of those questions both make sense and kind of make sense why they're being asked? Like, especially in a Buddhist slash religious context, like why people would want to know these things? Yeah. All right. Well, you, we're going to hear a lot about these 10 questions. So, if anything comes up, we can definitely explore deeper, but let's move on to the next part of this because I find the next part very funny. Oh, oh, I actually, I had one word, one interesting word thing uh, for all like the real Dharma heads out there. So the very last line of that where uh, uh, Malunkia Putta says, and if the Buddha doesn't answer these, then I'm just going to abandon the training and return to the low life. So the low life actually is the Hinayavati, Hinaya, like the small, you know it as the Hinayana, the little vehicle. But of course, there is no little vehicle in a sutta like this. So I just wanted to point out that they're using the word Hinaya, Hinayavati, as like the, the lesser life, the lower life which is interesting if you know about Hinayana as a kind of a derogatory term for like a bodhisattva slipping back to the low life of a Shravaka. So, all right, a little etymological aside. All right, let's see what happens with Malunkya Putta though. So after having this thought that either I'm gonna stay or I'm gonna go, then when it was evening, You'd think he would wait until morning. I don't know. I would wait until the morning to ask the Buddha myself. But then when it was the evening, the Venerable Malunkya Putta rose from meditation and went to the Blessed One. After paying homage to him, he sat down at one side and told him, Here, Venerable Sir, while I was alone in meditation, the following thought arose in my mind. These speculative views have been left undeclared by the Blessed One. If he does not declare these things to me, then I will abandon the training and return to the low life. If the Blessed One knows that the world is eternal, let the Blessed One declare to me the world is eternal. If the Blessed One knows that the world is not eternal, then let the Blessed One declare to me that the world is not eternal. If the Blessed One does not know either the world is eternal or the world is not eternal, then it's straightforward for one who does not know and does not see to just say, I don't know, I don't see. If the Blessed One knows that the world is finite or the Blessed One knows that the world is infinite, or if the Blessed One knows that the soul or the jiva is the same as the body, or that the soul or the jiva is one thing and the body is another, or if the Tathagata, the Buddha, knows that after death a Tathagata exists, or after death a Tathagata does not exist, if the Blessed One knows that after death a Tathagata both exists and does not exist, let the Blessed One declare that to me. If the Blessed One knows after death that Tathagata neither exists nor does not exist, let the Blessed One declare that to me. If the Blessed One does not know either that after death the Tathagata both exists and does not exist, or after death the Tathagata neither exists nor does not exist, then it's straightforward 
for one who does not know and does not see to say, I don't know. I don't see. All right. So Malunkya Putta recalls his thoughts to the Buddha. And he says to the Buddha, hey, and if you don't know, <laughs> it's cool. Just be straight up about it and tell me that you don't know. You don't have to beat around, like play, like, oh, I'm not going to answer that. Right? All right. To, to which the Buddha properly responds. How then, Malunkya Putta? Did I ever say to you, come, Malunkya Putta? Lead the holy life under me, and I will declare to you that the world is eternal, or that it's not eternal, or that it's finite, or not finite, or that the jiva and the body are one thing, or they're not the one thing. Did I ever declare that after death, the Tathagata neither exists nor does not exist? Did I say that to you, Malunkya Putta? No, venerable sir. And Malunkya Putta, did you ever tell me? I will lead the holy life under you, and the Blessed One will declare to me the world is eternal, or it's not eternal, or it's finite, or it's not finite, or the body's one thing and the jiva's another thing, or they're the same thing, or that after death the Tathagata neither exists nor does not exist? No, venerable sir. I didn't say that to you, right? That being so, Mogapurisa, that being so misguided man, who are you? And what are you abandoning? So excellent, excellent answer by the Buddha, right? First of all, did I ever tell you I was going to say the answers to those things? Like, did, was that in the, in the advertisement? Like, you know, join the Sangha and I'll tell you these things. So the Buddha is saying, I never said I was going to tell you those things, nor did you tell me that I'm only going to join the Sangha if you tell me whether the world's eternal or not, <laughs> right? The Buddha is saying that was never part of our, our agreement here. So who are you and what are you going to abandon, right? If anyone should say thus, I will not lead the holy life under the Blessed One until the Blessed One declares to me that the world is eternal, or it's not eternal, or it's finite, or it's not finite, or so on and so forth, including after death, the Tathagata neither exists nor does not exist. If somebody came to me and said that, well, that would still remain undeclared by the Tathagata. And meanwhile, that person would die. And now here comes the famous analogy that is often used. So the Buddha says to Malunkya Putta, suppose Malunkya Putta, a man were wounded by an arrow thickly smeared with poison and his friends and companions, his kinsmen and relatives, they brought a surgeon to treat him. But the man says, I will not let the surgeon pull out the arrow until I know whether the man who wounded me was a noble or a Brahmin or a merchant or a lowly worker. And the man would say, I will not let the surgeon pull out this arrow until I know the name and, and the clan of the man who wounded me. And I won't, let the man, I won't let the surgeon take out the arrow until I know whether the man who wounded me was tall or short or of middle height. I won't let the surgeon take out the arrow until I know whether the man who wounded me was dark skin or brown or golden skinned, until I know whether the man who wounded me lives in this such a village or such and such a town or such a city, until I know whether the bow that wounded me was a long bow or a crossbow. I won't let the surgeon take out the arrow until I know whether the bowstring that wounded me was, was a fiber or a reed or a sinew or made of hemp or bark until I know whether what kind of feathers the shaft that wounded me was fitted, whether those of a vulture or of a heron or a hawk or a peacock or a stork. 
I won't let the surgeon take out the arrow until I know of what kind of sinew the shaft that wounded me was bound, whether that of an ox or a buffalo or a deer or a monkey. I won't let the surgeon take out the arrow until I know what kind of arrowhead it, it was that wounded me, whether spiked or razor tipped or curved or barbed or calf toothed or lance And this would still not be known by that man. And meanwhile, he would soon die. <laughs> so too, Malunkya Putta, if anyone should say thus, I will not lead the holy life under the Blessed One until the Blessed One declares to me, the world is eternal, or the world's not eternal, or the world's finite, or the world's infinite, or the jiva and the body are the same thing, or the jiva and the body are two different things, or the Tathagata exists after death, or the Tathagata does not exist after death, or the Tathagata both exists and doesn't exist after death, or after death, the Tathagata neither exists nor does not exist. All of that would still remain undeclared by the Tathagata, and meanwhile that person would die. All right. The famous, the famous arrow analogy. So, any questions before we move on to the next section? Yeah, no. Um, it's just a minor question. Is is that story in other sutras as well? Yep. That's why, because I don't think I've ever read this sutra, but I've definitely heard it. So it Yeah, there's a famous, uh, it, I'm not sure where it appears, but it does appear somewhere else. I think it's still Malunkya Putta, though. Okay. Actually. okay. Um, so he must have been maybe associated with this or with that analogy. But Thank you. Mm-hmm. Okay, so next I wanna dive deeper into the Dharma of all of this, um, which is gonna come off of the next, uh, about paragraph six there. Actually, yeah, I guess the next section six, but I do wanna address something really quickly. I know that for me, like as a student, like as a Dharma student for years and years and years, I knew about the 10 unanswered questions of the Buddha and what I had heard, what I had even taught for years and years and years, just because that's what I had been taught, I had always been taught that the Buddha didn't answer these questions because he didn't see the value in them. With sort of the implication that there is an answer, but saying it wouldn't be appropriate or something. And that idea that the Buddha didn't answer these because they sort of uh, aren't appropriate is actually voiced, that, that idea is voiced in the sutta in section eight. So we're gonna get there, but it's not, doesn't really say that exactly. So I just wanna address sort of again, what I had always understood about these, but it's not how I understand them now. And especially it's not how I understand them after this section. So after this description about, you know, the analogy of asking all of these questions about the arrow and then dying before you can treat it, the Buddha says, yeah, it's like that. And then in section six, he says, Malunkya Putta, if there is the drishti, if there's the view, the world is eternal. The holy life cannot be lived. And if there is the view that the world is not eternal, the holy life cannot be lived. Whether there is the view that the world is eternal or there's the view that the world is not eternal, either way, there is birth, there is aging, there is death, there is sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair. The destruction of which I prescribe here and now. 
All right, so let's deal with that one, but then I do want to kind of give all of the questions their kind of due time in that sense. So right there, the Buddha says it. If you have the view that the world or your subjective experience of the world, right? So remember, tonight we're going to read this kind of every which way we can. But the Buddha is saying that if you have the view that the universe or the world or your subjective world if you have the view that any of those is eternal, the holy life can't be lived. If you hold the view, if you have the view that the world or the earth or whatever, or your subjective experience is not eternal, you can't, you, you, the holy life can't be lived. And why? Because either way, there is birth, aging, death, sorrow, lamentation, despair, and so on. And that's exactly what I'm prescribing against, he says. The prescription that I have of the Dharma is not birth, old age, sickness, death, lamentation, and sorrow. So now again, let's, I want to kind of try to um, take everything I was saying at the beginning of this session and now bring it back because what i want to kind of get at i kind of want to stir up a conversation here but i want to get at the idea of like so the buddha is basically saying if you kind of read it the way that i read it if you think the universe just is it exists forever and ever like maybe you're a big bang big crunch big bang big crunch big bang big crunch forever type of a person so if you think that the world goes on forever, or you think your subjective experience of being goes on forever, you can't lead the holy life. But if you think that the world is finite, if you're a nihilist, and you think all of this is eventually going to come to nothing, and then that's it, that's the end of the show, period, the world, the universe, my subjective experience of being is, is not eternal. And again, that's a, a good nihilist, a good nihilistic point of view is that it's just all not eternal. Well, if you hold that view, you can't lead the holy life. And why? Because either way, there is aging, death, Sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair. How how do we get there? How do we get to that? <laughs> and again, I want to stress it again. I, I'm I want to like be controversial in that way and say, you're saying if I believe in the Big Bang, I can't like lead the holy life. Yeah, <laughs> that's that's how I would read this, that if you are clinging to the view that that you somehow know what happened billions and billions and billions and billions of years ago, and you're solid about that, and you think that your feeble little human knowledge is 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 has got a hold of that. Yeah, good luck. But the idea is, is that if you are holding on to that view. Then you can't lead the holy life. But the same goes for the exact opposite in that way. But again, it doesn't matter about the view. It's the holding or the clinging to that view. Right? Same thing, of course, if we move on to the next one about finite and infinite. That idea that it, it's like, wait, if you're saying that I, I think there's an edge of the universe... <laughs> If I think the world or the universe is finite, I can't uh, lead the holy life. Yeah. <laughs> but if you think it's infinite, you can't lead the holy life either. Noe? <laughs> Smiles and giggles. Uh, stupid. But a question is the holy life. Mm. But it's the holy life. Exit. I'm glad you ask. Thank you. 
if we were to read the the Pali, which I was trying to read this afternoon, the holy life, what's being you know translated as the holy life here is actually brahmacharya. And for anybody out there that's never heard this term, this is a very important term in the world of Buddhism. Again, the word the word is Brahma Charya, the the work, the charya, the practice of Brahma. Brahmacharya is a very kind of um broad, almost generic term that is used in India for a kind of um asceticism, if you will, but where the term comes from, and this is totally related to what we're talking about, Noe, the word or the idea of brahmacharya comes from the metaphysical cosmological map, which says that the realm of form is the realm of brahma. The realm of desire, the kamadatu down here, the, the, the land of all the goodies. This is the realm of chakra, chakra devanam indra, basically Zeus in that way. But Brahma, the creator god, is the realm of just form. And if you know your Buddhism, you know that's the realm of the meditator. That's the realm of the Brahma viharas, the abodes of Brahma. Now, traditionally, because the realm of form is outside of or beyond the realm of desire, then traditionally, the way to get into the realm of Brahma was through celibacy. Because to be kind of involved in kama, in sexual desire, that, well, that is by definition to be in the kamadatu, to be in the realm of reproduction, to be in the realm of sexual reproduction. But to cultivate brahmacharya, the holy life, to cultivate brahma practice, meaning being celibate, moves you into the realm, or it's one thing, one aspect that moves you into the realm of form. So that's one kind of lead in or way in to this idea of, okay, so if I have all of these speculative metaphysical views about the world, about jiva, meaning, you know, the uh, life force energy in the body. So if I have these views about that, and I'm clinging to those views, I can't lead the holy life. I can't get up to see Brahma in that way. But, but, but no, I, I say too much, actually. The holy life is just being a good monk, being a good nun, being a good Buddhist in that sense. Okay. Any other, let, I mean, you know, I don't want to, um, I, I do want to kind of go through all of these, but again, the idea is, is that we get to the idea of the soul and body being one in the same or not. And so the Buddha is saying that if you say they are one in the same, then you can't lead the holy life. If you say that they are different, though, you also can't lead the holy life. So what we're noticing, and, and actually what this reminds me of right away, I hadn't thought about this, is if you remember, oh, I forget when it was. It was weeks and weeks ago now. But you'll remember that there were a few, we were reading all of these suttas and there were these uh, people that kept trying to uh, debate the Buddha, right? And um, there was one sutta we read where basically there was a householder who was encouraged to go debate the Buddha and basically tried to get the Buddha with a, 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 a two-pronged question. And he kind of, he was going to try to trick him because if he went this way, ah, I got you. But if you go this way, ah, I got you too. And of course, the Buddha was smarter than that and didn't answer the question because he saw that it was a two-pronged question in that way. This is very similar in that these questions to even 
like to even answer them is already wrong because you from a buddha like a buddha point of view like not even a buddhist point of view but from a buddha point of view the very question is already wrong <laughs> and so then to like answer it just says i i i uh, i agree with the wrongness of the question yeah and that's where the buddha's saying yeah so i don't even I don't even answer these in that way, because, but not because he doesn't know the answer. It's that he understands the nature of those questions as being uh, faulty in that sense. Yeah, no. Um, this is just fascinating. Okay. <laughs> I'm trying to, to, I'm not exactly sure what my question is, but I'm wondering, is there sort of an element of that that if if the Buddha said, oh yeah, the universe is finite, then there would be some way in which that would shut down some inquiry that is necessary for for you know that's that's part of the path. Is that is that part of it, or am I barking up the wrong tree? Mm, no, I it's. Mm, right tree um yeah let's do it this way gnome so i i really want us to like like get at this like and i want and i want us to understand like the 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 reasoning behind the buddha's refusal to answer these so let me do this so all of these questions can, and I've been implying this and even saying this all evening, but all of these questions could be, um, they are basically questions about the self. But of course that's complicated because I don't mean the ego exactly. I don't mean the body exactly. What do I mean? Well, we, that's where we need to kind of remember that all of these questions, all of this, all of these ideas are, are, they presume the reincarnation model. Like, I can't emphasize this enough that, that the idea that I, I'll put it to you the way that my, you know, teachers always put it to me exactly like the trees lose all their leaves in the fall and then in the winter they appear to be dead and then in the spring everything comes back to life only to then fall apart and appear to be dead again only to come back to life again that cyclicality is just in the indian worldview is just how it all works and what i mean is is that it just works cyclically 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 and so the reincarnation question but what i mean is is that the idea that after i die this all gets linguistically so complicated but the idea is is that after i die there's something right let's obviously there's something but let's presume that there's something that, that goes on to another life. And again, that's the presumption. But now the question is, does that keep going on forever? Or does it not go on forever? The question about finitude and infinitude is more actually about, does my true soul self extend infinitely everywhere or is it finite is my soul the same as this body or different than my body and if i did this buddhist thing and i got fully enlightened and became a fully enlightened tathagata would i exist after i die would i not exist after i die would i both exist and not exist or would i neither exist nor not exist so rather than like forget about the world and all of that, 
just think about this kind of more existentially about your subjective experience of being what, what you probably call being alive. And these questions are about whether that experience of quote, being alive, does it go on forever or not? Is it finite or not? Is it related to the body or not? And if I got fully enlightened, would I have another rebirth of, of some kind? <laughs> like, would I still have an ex experience? If you don't answer this, I'm leaving, right? But but that's like uh, uh, Malunkia Putta's idea. So now what I want to get at, now that I've kind of reframed the questions exclusively in terms of sort of soul reincarnation, now let's look at this more from that Buddhist point of view. And what I mean by that is, let's remember, let's just cut right to the wisdom the teaching is about this idea of no self. And what the Buddha always means by no Atman, no at an Atman. Remember, he's not exactly talking about this experience right now. This experience is happening right now. And so if you want to call this me and myself and I, fine, 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 fine. That's actually not what we're talking about. The Buddha is talking about the idea of you next year, the idea of you in 10 years, the idea of you in 20 years, or the idea of you in a next life. That's what the Buddha said actually doesn't exist. A self moving in time. So now if we understand that all of these questions are about the subjective experience of being, the question of, do I go on forever? You've already missed it. If you are wondering, do I go on forever? Oh, so you mean I stop? You mean when I die, it's done? There you go again, asserting this self. And then wondering, is this self eternal or not eternal? You've missed that there isn't even that self. Is it finite or infinite? You're missing that there's not that self there. Is it in the body? Is it related to the body? No, 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 no. You're missing it again. What if I realized no self? What if I was a tathagata, a thus come one? And I, which by definition is, I have realized there's no self. Does the question existing after death make any sense now pertaining to a tathagata but notice though that the answer is not no notice that the answer is not both notice nagarjuna notice that the answer nagarjuna is not that the Tathagata both exists and doesn't exist. <laughs> and I reference Nagarjuna because this is the famous uh, fourfold negation of neither existing, not existing, neither both existing, not existing, and neither not existing nor not, neither not. It gets too, too many negatives, but so that's Nagarjuna. Nagarjuna's fourfold negation actually comes from these 10 unanswered questions. It's basically a kind of an extrapolation of the Buddha's logic. Actually, this is, I didn't even plan on talking about Nagarjuna, but this is like a really good example of like how you move from early Buddhist thought where like the Buddha doesn't answer these 10 questions. And then Nagarjuna sort of picks up on that logic and develops what is called the fourfold negation. And it's still Buddha Dharma because it's coming from these teachings. So. Just a quick little aside there. Yeah, no, we're going all over the place now. Yeah, well, I, I feel like you did answer my question and, and it is, the answer sort of is yes. That is what one of the things the Buddha is trying to get us to do is to not be like, to by not answering the questions is to keep thinking about it because clearly we're not, we haven't thought about it enough or, or experienced it enough if we still are asking those questions, something like that. Indeed, a, a Malunkya Putta, for example, 
if yeah. he's still sitting wondering why hasn't yeah. the Buddha mentioned whether the world's finite or not? Yeah. Then yeah. yeah, he and I think it's why the Buddha's like, yo, misguided man. Yeah. Like, when did I ever say all of that? Mm hmm. Thank you. I think yeah. I'm here. Maria. Yeah, um, just wanted to add a couple thoughts. Um, so it seems like that, you, you know, like you were saying that built into the questions is, is faultiness, that the questions themselves are wrong and that it seems as though the Buddha's not answering them. And the way I always heard it was that they're not onward leading, but built into them is this implication of, of a dualistic view of reality. Um, and I could see how, um, you know, they're basically just a dead end and to even entertain them or pursue them or spend any time with them only blocks uh, the realization of non-dual reality or the true nature of reality. So um, yeah, those were, my thoughts about that. It's not just that it's not onward leading, it actually undermines the whole process. Um, mm -hmm. so. mm -hmm. That's definitely the way I would interpret, uh, especially it's the way I would understand when the Buddha says that if there is the view that the world is eternal, the holy life can't be lived. Like you're already stuck in this little cul-de-sac over here. And, and yeah, and it's not that you like couldn't, you would just have to sort of abandon that view in that way, right? Any other comments about what we've kind of talked about so far? Cool, then let's uh, finish up the sutta. So, well, actually, Actually, well, let me finish the sutta so I make sure I do it. And then we'll we'll circle back around and talk a little bit more about the dharma of all of this. So the main uh, section, section six there, where he talks about if there's this view, then there's going to be aging, death, sorrow, lamentation. And then in the next paragraph, he goes through all the other, uh, I guess, eight of the questions, all the way down to after death at Tathagata, uh, both exist and does not exist, then the holy life cannot be lived. And if there's the view after death, a tathagata neither exists nor does not exist, the holy life cannot be lived. Whether there's the view after death, or sorry. Yeah, so all of that. And then because the destruction of all of those things is what I prescribe here and now. And now, Paragraph or section seven. Therefore, Malunkya Putta, remember what I have left undeclared as undeclared, and remember what I have declared as declared. And what have I left undeclared? <laughs> Whether the world is eternal or not eternal, finite, infinite, and so on. I have, yeah, and all of that I have left undeclared. And why have I left that undeclared? Because it is unbeneficial. It does not belong to the fundamentals of the holy life. It does not lead to disenchantment, to dispassion, to cessation, to peace to direct knowledge, to enlightenment, to Nibbana. That's why I've left those 10 things undeclared. And what have I declared? This is suffering. I have declared. This is the origin of suffering. I have declared. This is the cessation of suffering. I have declared. This is the way leading to the cessation of suffering. I have declared. Why have I declared that? Because it's beneficial. It belongs to the fundamentals of the holy life. 
It leads to disenchantment, to dispassion, to cessation, to peace, to direct knowledge, to enlightenment, to Nibbana. That's why I have declared it. Therefore, Malunkya Putta, remember what I have left undeclared as undeclared, and remember what I have declared as declared. This is what the Blessed One said. The Venerable Malunkya Putta was satisfied and delighted in the Blessed One's words. All right, so there we have it. This idea that I've left these things undeclared. And why? Because they're unbeneficial. They don't belong to the fundamentals of the holy life. It doesn't lead to disenchantment. Dispassion, cessation, peace, direct knowledge, enlightenment, and nirvana. So that's what I was saying at the kind of before where that's usually the go-to answer for why. Why did the Buddha not answer these 10 questions? Because they weren't beneficial. And while that's true, because as we have discussed, they are not beneficial, but I don't actually think that's the reason why they're unanswered. I think it's deeper than that. And I think we've discussed why, why in that way. Um, and then, of course, there's this beautiful thing about, yeah, I didn't answer those things. I didn't declare that they're undeclared. But I did declare the four noble truths, right? I did declare that this is suffering, that this is the accumulation of suffering, usually translated as origin. And then this is the cessation and this is the path. So. All right. So I do want to circle back around a little bit. And I basically want to talk about. Oh, I kind of want to talk about the whole. Like. I guess he moves from. As soon as you have any of those things, meaning the idea of the world being eternal or not, the idea of finitude not, the idea of the body soul or not, he says, the minute you have any of those, then you, you've got birth. You got birth, you got aging. You got aging, you got death. Sorrow, lamentation, despair, pain, grief, and despair, right? So what's kind of like implied in all of that, and that's where we kind of, you know, one, it's helpful to have studied Dharma in that sense. But, you know, the Buddha sort of kind of basically talking about dependent origination in that sense. And it's kind of saying, and I want us to like recognize this. And... I, you know, in terms of Dharma, like, and we, you know, we finished the suture, so it's like freestyle hour now we're doing whatever. So what I want us to think about is like, pick a Dharma, any Dharma. So I'm going to use my pencil here. And the idea here is, is that this question of, well, is the pencil Will it last forever? <laughs> or will it not last forever? The idea here is, is that we can only, we can only entertain that question once we have something. But what I want us to notice is that as soon as you have something, you have this kind of lingering question of where did it come from? And in other words, you have the idea of birth. But it's like, notice that it's like implied. It's automatic. That as soon as there's a creature or a being, Ba baked right into that idea of a being is the idea of its birth, where it came from. In fact, what I want you to notice is that the very question of eternal or not, it presumes the whoop, 
that kind of arising. And now it's a question of, and so now that it is here, does it keep going forever or does it peter out and, and like die in that way? And the idea, of course, is, is that there's been a grand presumption already, the grand presumption of something. And so that's this idea that if there's the view that the world doesn't matter what now, it doesn't matter whether we're thinking about it as infinite, not eternal, not. But the, if there's the view, there's the world, you already have the idea of it coming into existence, which is birth. And if you have birth, then you automatically have this idea of aging. And if you have the idea of aging, you immediately have this idea of death, birth, death, and aging. It's a package deal. As I often kind of like, I often say this, if there was no like possibility of death, we wouldn't have to talk about life. It wouldn't make any sense because it would be like, yeah, life as opposed to what? So we notice that life and death are in this uh, inextricable dependent relationship. And so that's where you begin to recognize that if there is the insistence on self as existent already, well, there's a lot, you, you are claiming a lot more than just existence then, is the idea. It, this is the subtlety of, of Dharma, by the way, is noticing that the very idea that I am implies coming and going and duration and aging and all of these things. It's like, again, it's all part of a package deal. Even though the Buddha, again, is talking about the world and all of that, we can take it as being our subjective experience in that sense. So just noticing that, again, if you have any of these views, you don't get to just have that view. It's a package deal that will include all of the things, including sorrow, despair, lamentation, everything the Buddha is prescribing against in that way. So, all right. Um, oh, I'm sorry, Maria. You did. I, I'm bad with the chat. I'm terrible with the chat. So, I, it's funny. I was talking with a student of mine. I was talking with Renata earlier today, and we were talking about that relationship between kind of time and space meaning events like these things, you know, oh, sorry, I should read Maria's quote because not everybody can hear it. So Maria heard that things are events. She heard that the other day. And I, that's a very interesting idea of uh, what's one of the reasons why I kind of got initially drawn into studying the Chinese language is when I realized that in the Chinese language is so beautiful because a word, any given word can function as a verb or a noun or an adjective, depending on how it's kind of used within a sentence. And so that idea of like, uh, um, you, it, yes, it's a pencil, or it's an, a moment of penciling. It's like an adverb <laughs> happening. Like in Chinese, you could do that a little more uh, fluidly, if you know what I mean. Um, so that the interchange between nouns and verbs and adjectives is more fluid. Whereas in English, you could say, so I'm going to see your quote again, that things are events, turning objects into uh, like progressive unfoldings, perhaps. It would be a much more Buddhist way of looking at the world, Maria, frankly, um, rather than entities, like fixed entities with svabhava, right, with inherent nature, it's more of a, in the moment, there is that. Yeah. Nice. Any other wonderful comments or questions evoked from the sutta? Noe? 
Oh, thank you. Yeah, I'm I'm kind of jumping around because I, I I got kind of stuck on that idea of the of the body, the one about the man, uh, the yeah. person, and their body forms, and is their life is there infinite, infinite or non infinite? Oops, I got stuck on it. See, I got a view on it. But then I go back to the idea that the Buddha did talk about the realms of hell, that he sure. does have the five destinations. Isn't that sort of speaking to a sort of being oh wonderful so the question is noe thank you i i i could have should have went into this earlier so noe's sort of asking about the the jiva body question the two questions about the is the jiva the life force the same as the body or not and what they're kind of referring to as i understand it noe it's it's about like, does the life force, can it exist out, like be, beyond the body? Or is it more like um, the, the classic analogy is when you have the candle and the candle flame and there's a, a candle, but there's no flame. So the classic analogy of reincarnation is about this candle passing the flame, which is the jiva, and the, the candle is the body. And, the, and the, the classic analogy of reincarnation is the flame energy being passed to a new body, a new candle. So this old candle has withered away. And there's a new candle, which is your new body. And there's been a transference of life force energy, which is how Noe's karma from this life body could then spill into the next. And again, Noe, as you know, if we're not into reincarnation stuff, this is just about this incarnation passing the flame of life to the next incarnation in a moment in the next breath and then that flame being passed to the next breath. So you do it either way, but follow me on the whole candle flame reincarnation analogy. Cause the question is, can the candle flame just exist? Or does it need the wick to like, cause a candle flame needs the wick. It needs the fuel to burn in that way. And so the question is, does the Jiva flame need the body? And in other words, is it like a, a direct transference of the flame, the Jiva flame of life to the next body? Is it a direct transfer or does the Jiva like become independent? And then ignite this new flame, but there's like an independence of the jiva. That's the question. And Noah, you will notice that uh, any which way, there is this clinging to identity and the wondering, well, what's going to happen to me after I die? Right? And, and then that, those are those interesting questions about, but what if I get enlightened? Then what happens to me after I die? And that's why I framed that. I framed that section by saying that no, a tathagata means one has realized there is no self. So, but it's still an interesting kind of conundrum in terms of like the the question is. There's still kind of a question there, though. All right. Any other comments, ideas? You know, I had originally planned on doing both the Malunkya Suttas tonight, but I'm I'm glad we just did this this one because these these ideas are very interesting, and I don't think we've done the um the ten unanswered questions before. I don't think it's ever come up, and this is kind of like the Sutta to go to for studying that. All right. Oh, Noe, something, Maria. Now everybody's got questions now. Noe, 
Just real. a quick one. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I just love it the way he puts it here, you know, because it, it is this is beneficial. It belongs uh, to the fundamentals of the holy life. It leads to the disenchantment, to dispassion, to the cessation, to peace, to direct knowledge, to enlightenment, to nirvana. This is what he this is what he this is what is said. And so I'm always come back because even before we got to number 10 or number nine and 10, I was already, but what about the four noble truths? Of course, mm -hmm. calm down. We'll get there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. Maria. <laughs> yeah, I'm always, I don't know. I feel like this is the edge for me. So the Tathagata, does not generate karma. Uh, well, that but, will really uh, depend, but go on. But a, but a bodhisattva does, does generate some karma. So, yeah. I don't, I'm always, the edge for me feels like this whole idea of what hmm. is, what happened during the Pari Nirvana and then like, hmm. I don't know, this whole process and that that whole thing being, you know, sort of realizing everything as mind or everything as Buddha and then that's what it is. So I don't know, like I say, and then I'm at a loss for words to even talk about it. So, um, but I feel like that's kind of where I'm, the things I've been thinking about and kind of the edge there though, but for this moment, Tathagata doesn't generate karma. Um, yeah, that's a tricky one. Um, I would, the thing about it is, So I've I've I haven't mentioned this for a long time. So I actually think it's very appropriate. It's appropriate to the sutta. It's very appropriate to answering Maria's question about the a Buddha and a enlightened being's production of karma. So let's clarify, let's remember whenever we're talking about karma in the in Indian culture, Indian philosophy. We are always talking both about the action and then the result of that action. Like karma is always about both of those things combined. Where, whereas if we only look at the action without the result, it's only sort of one side of karma. But then there's the, the retribution side of it that people focus on sometimes without focusing on the causal side of it, right? Like if something bad happens to me, it's like, oh, that's my karma. So there's the retribution side of it, but without the action side of it. Or there can be just thinking of karma in terms of action without seeing it as bound up with its repercussions. The only reason why I'm saying this, Maria, is because there is this idea that we might have and it's the an idea that I call, this is a pure Michaelism, a Michael Upaya, but it's the idea of what I call the karmic axis. And the axis is the idea that when I uh, believe in self, and, and particularly when I am convinced that this is self, right? That the skandhas are self. When I'm in that mode of identifying with the physical body as self, there's something that happens mentally regarding karma, which is that I become myopic and I become focused on the activity coming from this axis and I'm concerned about things coming back to the axis. What I mean is 
is that if if I put out a bunch of uh, uh, let's say I was let's say I was in a a live a live uh, situation here, and I was putting out a bunch of verbal karma to an audience, and then I said something, and it a bunch of people laughed. Karmic cause, karmic result. And there's the way in which I'm hearing the laughter and I'm like, ah, they, oh, you, okay, they think that's funny, okay. So karmic cause, karmic effect. But now I say something and somebody throws something because they don't like what I, I hear, but it flies and it hits over here. Doesn't matter to me because that's not me. But then somebody throws something and it, it hits me. And now I'm upset because it came back to the axis. So what I'm getting at is, is that when there's this kind of obsession or delusion about self, we become only concerned about the karma coming from here and the karma that comes back to here. And what I mean by what I'm getting at is, is that if something befalls you, I'm going to say, ah, that's your karma. But the reality of this giant karma ball called life, the reality is, is that all of our karmas are all vastly intertwined. And actually what's happening over here intimately is related to me. It's all intimately related. And so what I'm getting at is, is that you could think of Buddhahood or Tathagatahood as a kind of smashing of the karmic axis delusion. But it doesn't mean there's no more karma and no more karmic. Uh, in, in other words, if there wasn't Buddha karma, then the Buddha's teaching wouldn't have any effects of enlightenment, but the Buddha isn't interested in the karmic axis of themselves getting enlightened. They are enlightened. So now a Buddha can be described as having kind of like inconceivable karma because the axis of that karma is completely unattainable. That kind of makes sense. Oh, good. A subtle idea, but all right. Well, then, with that note on smashing the delusion of the karmic axis, <laughs> um, let's call it an evening. That's it for me. Like I said, I'll be back next week with the longer, with the Maha Malunkya Putta Sutta. So stay tuned for that. Uh, real quick, if you haven't heard, I'm doing a year-long sutra study class on the Avatamsaka Sutra. Uh, exciting. Many people are already getting involved. So if you're interested in that giant Mahayana Sutra and a year-long sutra study with me every Tuesday morning, once a month, go over to lotusunderground.com and sign up. Otherwise, I'll be back next Sunday with a Hinayana Sutta. Uh, and that's it. Thanks, everybody.